Hello everyone and happy holidays. I'm Lyndall Stout. As part of our holiday gift to you, we are taking a look back at some of our favorite sunup stories of all time. First up is a couple of features on wheat harvest from the oldest Oklahoma producer we've ever met to one of the youngest. If, uh, if we could grow it, we didn't have a price. If we had a price, we couldn't grow it. <laughs> But this year, it's, it's, uh, the price has come up quite a little bit, and it's been a pretty good year. It's been really good. It's, uh, test weights are great, 64, had some 65. Yields are good, 50 to 70 probably. So, yeah, for up here, that's real good. Four generations of Williams have actually farmed this Cimarron County land, which started with KB just after the Dust Bowl. I was graduated from high school in 37. That's back there when we worried a lot about the dirt blowing if we didn't get the wheat to cover the ground, you know. And we generally sowed if we got the moisture, we sowed in August back there then just to get the ground covered in. He worked like people today can't even imagine. Well, it's amazing what he can do. Yeah, I was never scared of work. And I just enjoyed farming real well. It's just all he's done for so long that he, he doesn't want to quit. Not many of them still got a grandpa that's 100 years old runs a combine. but That's right. Troy said that his grandpa is 100 years old and still running a combine. If you've ever been in the cab watching the header glide through the wheat across an open prairie, you know it's a special feeling. It was the possibility to help with one more wheat harvest that motivated KB to fight after he fell and broke his hip a few months ago. He wanted to get back in the driver's seat for his 79th wheat harvest. Go for it, as long as you can do it. He spent a lot of time on the combine, and uh, he uh, said as long as he can get in there and sit, why, he was fine. Well, <laughs> he just loves it so much, you know. He I can't tell him no. <laughs> He's probably about through with this farming now, but. When a seed is planted, harvest is the goal. It's only through love, protection from what the Oklahoma Panhandle can throw at it, and a little rain, that a seed of wheat can grow into something bigger than itself. In a way, KB planted a seed, and it grew into a strong farming family that takes pride in all that it produces. If this is his final season to cut wheat, he sure is making the most of a victory lap for a Cimarron County farmer that grew more than crops. K.B. Williams grew a legacy. Really, it's been a, been a pretty good life. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for anything else. Brittany Crable is no stranger to wheat harvest and no stranger to combines. As she takes me on a couple of rounds, we talk crop quality. I was hoping that it was like this, hoping and praying it was good, and it's been a blessing to see that it is. And what it takes to keep this massive machine running smoothly. I'm trying to keep it in the wheat and out of the dirt. <laughs> that's the main thing, yeah. Across the field, that's also the main objective for Brittany's grandpa, Wayne Crable who at age 82 spent a lot of years on open air combines. Uh, probably still suffering from the days when no cabs on the combine, you sit in that dirt for hours and hours, but I loved it anyway. That shared love of the land and harvesting what you've sown is already shaping Brittany's future. Why are you doing this? I rode with my grandpa and my dad a lot when I was little and I have memories of falling asleep in that same passenger seat or doing combine math and slowly but surely I started to fall in love with it. In fact, 10 years ago this week, her mom Karen snapped this picture of Brittany at age seven, side by side with her dad Jeff in the field. I've always tr tried a little bit to play devil's advocate and say you can be anything you want to be, you can go anywhere you want to be, that decision's always yours to make. Just because your ancestors have farmed does not mean you have to. If you want to, we will support you. I've always tried to give her that option, that she it was her choice. A decision Brittany confirmed as Jeff, her father, was dying of cancer. I remember in my 
the last month he was alive, he turned to me and looked at me, grabbed my hand, and said, are you going to come back? And even though I knew before then that I wanted to come back, that really solidified my choice that this is where I need to be. On the land that would have been her father's and will now go to her, the fifth generation of Crable to harvest wheat on these very acres. And to be able to pass that on to another generation is very satisfying. Hard to believe Brittany is only 17 and will be a senior at Hinton High School this fall. They put their entire lives into working to make these farms run and to see that pay off I think is a great success for them to know that somebody's going to carry on what they love too. And no doubt that someone, Brittany, is making all those who came before her pretty proud. Dr. Kim Anderson joins us now, our crop marketing specialist. Kim, we want to talk about corn and soybeans today. Let's start with a little bit of historical perspective on the base prices so we have kind of a starting point for the discussion on comparisons. Well, you look at uh, historical prices. If I tell you, you know, bean prices are $11.70, what does that mean? Well, if you go back and look at corn uh, for the 2009 through 21 uh, years, the average Oklahoma price was $4.20. The low price during that period during harvest was $2.75. That was in the 16 harvest. And the high price was $7.10. That was in the 19 harvest. Now coming into soybeans, $10.20 is your average price over the 9 through 21 time period. Your low price was $7.50, that was in the 18 harvest, and the high price was $14.80, and again, that was in the 2012 harvest. Let's talk now about current price levels. Well, we're looking at current price levels, you got corn at around $5.75. Uh, for forward contract in the 22, $5.20, that's a minus 15 basis off of that November 22 price. Uh, milo prices are running about, oh, for the forward contract, 15 cents below corn, a dime above corn for the current price. Soybeans, $12, relatively good price there. Forward contract for 22 delivery, $11.70. That's minus 75 under that November 22 contract. You've got cotton coming in at $1.02 a pound. Way to go, cotton. And harvest uh, for the uh, 22 crop, right now around 87 cents. That was that November, December cotton contract at 90 cents and a three cent uh, basis there. Why are we seeing relatively high prices? A lot of people are asking that question because we've got record corn uh, world production and record uh, soybean world production. Corn production, 47.6 billion bushels compared to 44.2 in 20. The average is 43.9 major production. You look at the United States on corn, a record 15.1 billion bushels. Soybeans, 14 billion bushels on the world. Uh, you go back to 2013.5 uh, in the United States, 4.4 billion bushels, not a record but close to it, and your average at 4.2. So excellent bean production. Again, it's a demand situation. You've got increased demand for your corn and your beans and your, your lentil products, and that is driving up our prices. Let's talk now about how the U.S. fits into the world market. You go back 20, 30 years, the U.S. is a major player, but right now the United States exports 31% of the world's corn exports. Brazil and Argentina ex 40%, and Ukraine export 16 percent. In other words, Brazil, Argentina, and Ukraine export 56 percent of the world's corn exports. If you look at competing with you, the United States on corn, you've got Brazil and Ar Argentina at, you know, in the spring and summer months when we've got ours in the ground and you've got your crane that's harvested about the same time as the U.S. crop competing, competing with us in the Asian countries and the European countries in North Africa. So we don't carry near the power we used to. We're a major player in the corn market, but not the, don't have the strength and price discovery as we used to. You look at uh, soybeans, 32% of the world's soybean exports. Brazil alone is 55% of the world's soybean exports. Argentina, three, right there is 58% right there. Uh, those countries, uh, they, they ha sometimes double crop with the soybeans and with the corn, which competes on that world market. Plus, 
between now and the harvest in 22, the southern hemisphere, Brazil and Argentina, will harvest both corn and soybeans and put them on the export market that could potentially drive our prices down. So as we look at our price going on out to uh, say the 22 crop, I think there's more risk with corn prices and bean prices than there are with wheat prices. I said, remember I said last week that wheat prices should hold relatively strong. And so Brazil and Argentina crops will put pressure on U.S. corn and bean prices between now and our 22 harvest. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. And from all of us at SUNUP, of course, happy holidays, Merry Christmas to you and your family. And to yours. Okay, thanks a lot. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. It is the holiday time of year, and I'm honored today to be joined by the longtime face of Cow Calf Corner, Dr. Glenn Selk. Glenn, you're the expert on the topic. What can you tell us about reindeer as far as the basic facts? Well, let's, let's start with some real basics of uh, what we know about reindeer. First of all, they've been domesticated to be used by humans for over 5,000 years. Now, we know by looking at him, Santa's no spring chicken himself, is he? So we really know that since he's been around not only the corner a few times, he's been around the world a number of times, they're not gonna get lost on Christmas Eve. So we don't have to worry about that. We do know that reindeer are ruminants just like these heifers that are standing back here in this pen behind us. They have four compartments to their stomach. Now, some people say they have four stomachs, but it's really more four compartments to their stomach. That means then that they can hold a lot of feed that can help them make that long journey on Christmas Eve. Now, Santa, he's a pretty sharp old dude. He's kind of like some of our OSU scientists here uh, in the Animal Science Department. He knows that these reindeer, since they're ruminants, can digest forages very, very well. But forages take a longer time to digest than, say, grain. And it's just like when your mother or my mother, before they sent us off to school as little kids, said, have a good breakfast, something that'll stick to your ribs. Well, Santa's going to do the same thing. He's going to fill those reindeer up with moss or hay on that uh, night before uh, they head out on that Christmas Eve journey because that'll stick to their ribs. They'll have plenty of energy to, to make the, the rounds. Some people worry about whether the reindeer have a chance to get a good drink of water while they're traveling on Christmas Eve. Don't worry about it. You know, they live in an environment that's, uh, for most of the years, covered with snow and ice. Those reindeer have learned how to uh, lick the snow, the ice. They'll do the same thing on the rooftops of those uh, homes that are in northern climates. They'll have a chance to get, uh, certainly, a good drink in that situation. And if they're in the south, there's going to be opportunities to get a drink of water out of uh, open lakes and, and ponds, rivers. So I don't think we need to worry about those reindeer having enough to eat or to drink during that long Christmas Eve journey. So that rumen is a big benefit. Oh, so. no question about it. That really helps them uh, have enough of that energy coming from the moss or the hay, and they'll, they'll get along just fine. Okay, so Glenn, our big question, how do reindeer really know how to fly? Well, again, let's go back to what we do know. Uh, I, I admit, that's, that's the tough one. But what we do know about reindeer, they're different than the deer that we have here in Oklahoma. They have a long antler. The, uh, a full-grown reindeer has an antler that's about four feet in length. Each reindeer has two antlers, okay? So the antler span on an average full-grown reindeer is eight feet. Santa's got eight reindeer. Nine, if it's a foggy Christmas Eve. Remember, he has to pull in Rudolph. Right. So you got eight feet of antler span on each reindeer. Eight reindeer, that adds up to 64 or 72 feet on a foggy Christmas Eve of antler span. Well, I went out here and looked at, at some of the airplanes at Stillwater Airport. I measured the wingspan on an airplane. It's a typical airplane. 
it's only 36 feet of wingspan. Santa's got 64 to 72 feet of antler span to work with. Now, can they get enough speed up to get off the ground with that, that antler span? Well, University of Alaska scientists have studied reindeer for a long time. One of the things they found out was that a newborn baby reindeer at one day of age could outrun their fastest graduate student. So if they're that fast, can run that fast, when they're one day of age, just think how fast they can be when they're adults. Got all that speed, that antler span, I've had no doubt that they can then get up and, and get elevated and get in the air. Yeah. So, Glenn, what are some of the myths that we need to dispel about reindeer? Well, it goes back to what we talked about with uh, the reindeer that Santa has in, in his part of the world and that he uses on Christmas Eve are different from the deer that we have here in Oklahoma. You perhaps have heard uh, in, in one of the poems about tiny reindeer feet. Uh -uh. Reindeer have a, a hoof that's about the size of what a adult cow has. They're a pretty wide hoof. That comes in real handy when they're trying to get the uh, enough surface area to stop on those small roofs that they have to land on each Christmas Eve. So that really comes in handy for them. Now another thing that you might have heard in one of the songs is about reindeer going click, click, click. That one's true because reindeer have a tendon that goes over their knee and every time they move that, that tendon tends to make kind of a clicking sound. So that one's true. I tell you, uh, as we look and, and learn more about reindeer, it sure makes me think that Santa's going to find us on Christmas Eve. I don't know about you, Mark. I'm going to go to bed early and make sure I'm asleep when he comes to my house. I plan to do the same thing, Glenn. I really appreciate you being with us. And all of you out there watching today, Merry Christmas. And now we want to look back at another SunUp favorite story that takes us behind the scenes at a Christmas tree farm. And then our sister show, Oklahoma Gardening, will give us some tips on what to do with our Christmas trees after Christmas. Time now to get into the holiday spirit, and there's no better place to do that than right here at the Christmas tree farm. Welcome to the Sorghum Mill Christmas Tree Farm just outside Edmond, Oklahoma. They cut them, we cut them, or we have some that are already cut, pre-cut okay. trees. I got it. It's the busiest time of year for this choose and cut operation. Yep, yeah, not today. John Knight is the owner, grower, and all-around businessman. It's a, a daylight till dark operation. We're out here every day in these fields, six days a week. We grow Colorado blue spruce in this field. We grow blue ice and Carolina sapphire and some Christmas trees. So in the field we go for a Christmas tree tour like none other. John has seven fields and 35,000 Christmas trees. We use a lot of these large lop lollies. See the ones we've shared for Christmas trees. We sell, we sold a tree last night 28 feet. He also grows and sells Virginia pines, along with Scotch, Austrian, and Eastern white pines, Leyland cypress, blue ice, and Carolina sapphire. And this was just planted recently, and this one was as well. You plant and in the fall? Uh-huh, we plant in the fall and the spring. This is last year's tree. You can see it's got some pretty nice growth on it. This is mostly new trees in here. We've and John most, most loves each and every one. Uh, after and all, this is his 32nd ground, year. We've been doing it so many years, we know exactly when to do it and how to do it. Of course, you can have variations depending on the bugs and the weather, uh -huh. it, uh, but it's normally pretty close. Like in June, you know that you, you're going to have to spray and you know you're going to have to shear. And don't forget about mowing all this in spring and summer, 45 acres to be exact. You have to keep the grass count down. The trees will not grow with the grass. They won't grow quickly enough and they won't grow into the proper shape. They need all the nutrients and moisture they can get and we keep the grass killed back 18 inches from the tree all the way around. We can do what is called banding. But he hasn't always been this organized. And in the beginning years it was so tough I just 
just uh, almost gave it up a couple times. That's what I've heard. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it tested me. The rows of trees were once home to an oil field. John reclaimed and reconditioned the land, a 15-year ordeal, and then started planting trees. The first year, he sold a mere 16. And they were ugly because I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, that was the ugliest trees. I couldn't believe it. People felt sorry for me. It's the only reason they bought them. But I knew that I had something. Everyone told me, my father said, son, don't do that. People will not buy those trees. He says, you've been a good son. You've been pretty smart all your life. He says, you're, you're really making a huge mistake. Of course, he didn't live to see this. And uh, now we sell several thousand trees. In fact, about 5,000 of his trees go into homes and businesses around the Oklahoma City metro and beyond. If you had a live Christmas tree and you're ready to take it down or maybe it's starting to lose enough pine needles that you're ready to just get it out of the house, that doesn't mean Christmas decoration has to be over just yet. While it had a great life out in nature, then you brought it in to enjoy it as a Christmas tree, you can also re-gift it back to nature by decorating it with natural Christmas ornaments for the wildlife. So we've got a couple of examples that you can use here. Of course, the traditional string of popcorn or Cheerios with cranberries is a great, great way to make garland, but there's also some other things that you can introduce like fresh fruit or even dehydrated fruit. So get some oranges or apples and slice those up and it's really easy for the kids to thread those. Now when you are threading stuff, you want to try to make sure that you're using some sort of natural uh, or cotton yarn or twine. And so that can just kind of break down versus some of the synthetic ribbons and things like that. Uh, dried raisins is another good thing that wildlife might like to forage on. Now another option for making ornaments is to get pine cones and then smear those with peanut butter and then roll them in bird seed. Now if you or your kids are allergic to peanut butter, another option would be to use Crisco or some sort of animal fat to do that or suet um, and, and then smear it with the bird seed. Another thing to keep in mind though with these oily substances is when we have warmer temperatures they can get a little bit oily which means they can get on those birds feathers as they're trying to get to that bird seed which isn't good because it prevents that bird from being able to thermoregulate their their temperature as well as they would like to do. So in order to help reduce that um, problem, what we can do is we can mix in some cornmeal, get a nice consistency with cornmeal and peanut butter or your Crisco. It'll still be sticky enough to roll it in that uh, bird seed, but it'll take away and dry up some of that oil, preventing it from getting on those bird's feathers. So they go crazy for these ornaments. So this is a great addition. They are a little bit heavy, so make sure you have some strong branches to hang those on. The other thing is birds really do love the black seed um, oiled sunflowers seeds. So if you're looking to which uh, sunflower seed or bird seed to put on there, make sure you're looking at the black oiled sunflower seed. That's a good option. By putting your Christmas tree out in your backyard, and again, I would recommend putting it a little bit further away from the main part of the house, because obviously we're gonna be inviting creatures into our backyard. A way to incorporate the educational component is to have your kids observe the wildlife that comes and visits that tree. So they can simply observe it during the day to see how many different bird species they can identify by using different bird guides to identify those birds or an even neater option would be to set up a wildlife cam on it at night to see what sort of creatures come through. So this is a fun family activity and again even though Christmas may be over and you're ready to take down the decorations it doesn't mean that they have to completely go away but why not re-gift it back to nature. As the year 2021 comes to an end, it, it's really important for me to take time to say thank you uh, to all of you, to everyone who's had such a tremendous influence on uh, the Ferguson College of Agriculture, OSU Extension, OSU Ag Research. It really has been a very productive year for us in many ways. In spite of the pandemic, uh, we've had record enrollment, uh, new students coming in this fall in numbers greater than we've ever had before, except for one time. And so it's great to have that kind of recognition of the uniqueness of our programs and the impact that they have on our students. Our, our extension educators and specialists have been very busy around the state, delivering programs and helping people adapt to uh, the many challenges that we've faced. Weather has been a challenge, sometimes too much rain, uh, more often not enough rain. 
Uh, and uh, our specialists and our educators have been out there helping people adapt to that as well. Uh, our research faculty have been extremely successful uh, bringing in record uh, amounts of grant funding to support the work that they're doing to try to understand uh, better how we can live with the resources that we have and make use of those for uh, our economic development uh, and the success of families and communities across the state. So in so many ways, uh, it's been a very productive year. Of course, we've had some highlights. We celebrated the groundbreaking event for our New Frontiers project the new building for the Ferguson College of Agriculture uh, that will be opening in a uh, little less than three years. Uh, and so we had the groundbreaking in, in April. We've had other events celebrating uh, the, uh, the many people who have come forward and made gifts uh, to help support the funding for that project. Uh, and it's just been tremendous to experience the show of goodwill uh, and excitement that people have about that project, but more importantly, the excitement and support that we have for all that we do uh, in OSU agriculture. So here at the end of 2021, with all of the excitement that we have from what we've done this year, I'm just as excited about the year ahead in 2022. And so with that, I want to take time to say thank you to all of you who give us the pleasure of serving you and, and those of you who support us in all that we do. So wish you happy holidays, uh, a successful new year, and as always, we say, go Pokes. Thanks so much for joining us this week for SUNUP. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. From all of us at SUNUP to you and your family at home, happy holidays, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.